Dr. Sukaria is uh, a diplomat of the American Board of Prosthodontics. He currently holds the position of assistant professor at Boston University Institute for Dental Research and Education in Dubai, in the Department of Prosthodontics. He also holds an appointment as adjunct assistant professor at Boston University Goldman School of Dental Medicine in Boston. Dr. Sukaria completed his pre-doctoral degree in Beirut in 2003 in Lebanon, where he also maintained a private practice. He completed the dual uh, CAGS and MD, MSD postdoctoral residency program in prosthodontics in 2009 at the Boston University. Uh, he conducts and lectures on biomaterials research and color and is currently involved in ongoing research on ceramics. Please welcome Dr. Sukaria. Again, my name is Faisal Sukaria. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about ensuring success with modern CAD CAM. What I did is a ceramic inlay on a second premolar. Uh, the, the, this patient happens to be a severe bruxer. She came in with uh, a gold inlay, and uh, she requested the ceramic inlay. And I succumbed to her needs. And I thought, well, I've done hundreds of Emacs inlays, and why, why should it fail right now? So less than three months later, this is how the patient came back. And I really was going against my beliefs. Uh, I really should have done another gold inlay. That gold inlay was there for 30 years without any problems until it had a little bit of recurrent decay and needed to be changed. My beautiful ceramic second premolar inlay lasted less than three months. So it really made me look bad, and she's the wife of a very good friend of mine. So that also made it even worse. So what happened? Why did, why did this break? I mean, I, I went against, as I said, I went against what I believed in. If you look at the tooth next to it, you see that it's completely worn down. And I should have thought better that to, to look at the, everything and look at the big picture and, and decide what I'm going to do. So really, if you want to look at success, and regardless of it being a, a, a modern material a, or a historical material, uh, success is really based on the design and what you're designing out of. Uh, I will go through a certain concept of certain concepts of what I was uh, taught in at school uh, as a, a pros resident and what we are teaching our residents right now. So I'll, I'll briefly go through a couple of ideas and I, I really made this presentation smaller because it's uh, at six o'clock and everybody is you know a little bit tired. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. So uh, let's, let's discuss cantilevers, for example. This is another Lebanese uh, building, and it's, uh, it's around the 20th century or 19th century building. And if you look at the balcony, which, which is a cantilever, if you look at the balcony then, when they designed it, it was a small balcony because they did not have the technology to actually build something that you know, goes out in the air for 30 meters. If you look at modern technology and look at, for example, the helipad on the Burj al-Arab, it's, it's 60 meters high in the air and it's 30 meters outwards and there are helicopters landing on it. And if you think about it, they're both cantilevers, but because of the technology that we have as far as engineering and higher strength steel in this case, we ended up having, uh, we were able to design something like that. However, uh, a helipad on Burj al-Arab is not... Uh, zirconia on teeth. Uh, in no way you look. You can do the comparison of uh, building on uh, natural dentin and bone and cementum and periodontal ligaments and compare that to structural buildings which are on, on rock. So, and actually, this picture is not something that I did. It's, it's something that I picked up from the internet from one of the labs, and they're really boasting how well, you know, well advanced the technology is and how they can do two cantilevers in the posterior direction and distal and how nice this whole zirconia framework looks. Uh, for a prosthetist resident and certainly for a prosthodontist, this looks like blasphemy. Uh, to me, uh, if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the literature uh, on cantilevers, for example, you know that they all fail earlier than non-cantilevered FPDs. And I, and I, myself, and most prosthodontists would like to, would not like to call these things bridges because it, it's talking about something else. But these fixed partial dentures, 
are failing, and they're failing more because we're relying more on the technology and relying less on what we learned in dental schools. So if you look at the same case after extraction, you can see that everything that could be designed wrong with this case has been designed wrong. If you look at the crown root ratio, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the preparations, if you look at the margin, if you look at the design, everything is wrong, except for the fact that it aesthetically it looks okay and it's made of zirconia, but everything else is wrong about it. If you look at cantilevers, and there was a study in 1992 by Awadallah, and he was, it was a finite element analysis, and basically it's a computer model of how forces would be transmitted on the teeth. And really, it's, it's, it's very common sense. If you, if you have two premolars that are splinted, for example, and you apply the screen force on the, on the, uh, uh, on the cantilever, most, most of the force is actually transmitted to that last abutment. So it doesn't really matter if you splint the whole arch and cantilever one tooth. The, most of the support is going to come from the tooth next to it, and most probably the uh, stresses will cause a deteriorate, uh, I mean, uh, uh, they will cause uh, problems with the last premolar and will cause it to fail. So, and then the tooth next to it will only get tensile strength, and tensile strength is in the other direction, so it's not even, even resisting the forces. The alternatives, obviously, would be implants and removable partial denture. Now, we would not like to do the RPD, and most patients do not accept it anymore. However, it's still something, it's still a treatment option that we give. Not all our treatments are beautiful zirconia FPDs and veneers. There are there's still uh, patients who require RPDs, there are still patients who require complete dentures. One other very fundamental uh, notion that we have and sometimes people thinking that you know because we have a better coping or a stronger crown that we can forget about certain things like the ferrule and I borrowed this slide from Dr. Steve Morgano and basically what this slide is showing that uh, we do need that color around the tooth that's that small piece of natural tooth to actually have the crown grab on top of it what happens is if you don't have that where the blue arrow is, if you don't have that tooth and the whole crown is sitting on the post, you do end up having problems. And most of the literature does advise to have 1.5 to 2 millimeters of ferrule whenever possible. Ferrule does reduce the potential for root fractures, for post fractures, post dislodgement, failure of cement seal of the crown. Uh, that is a really important uh, issue to address. One other issue is coronal coverage. Uh, we always see in, in presentations people trying to conserve tooth structure, and I do believe strongly in conserving every, uh, every piece of tooth. However, if we are not uh, doing coronal coverage on a molar, for example, and having that tooth fail after five years, I think we are losing more tooth structure than uh, the tooth structure we're trying to avoid cutting. And in this study by Nakaziri, at five years, the, the, there was only 30%, 36% success rate. That's almost one in three. And I don't know how many people in this room would like to take that chance, but I wouldn't. If we talked about occlusion, um, we cannot have one size fit all. Again, if you look at uh, CAD CAM software, it's always that beautiful dentiform uh, that ideal case where uh, everything looks nice, but really in the, in the real world you have, you know, you have occlusion that looks like that, you have, you have patients that look like that, and you have patients that look like that. We have class two, class three, you have people who have open bites. There are so many factors. It's not, uh, it is very important to, to, to slow down, to sit back, to, um, to take each case on its own and to, to design it appropriately. So, as, as I mentioned before, it's, it's an issue of design and the choice of materials. And if we wanted to talk about the choice of materials, there are many factors that uh, make us pick one material over the other. And it's really strength and longevity and aesthetics, ease of use and, and uh, cost, uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, we seem to focus more on strength and, and aesthetics, uh, but, but really we do have to consider the whole uh, the whole thing. If you look at flex flexural strength of the modern 
uh, CAD CAM materials. Uh, we definitely see that the zirconia is a very strong material, around 1,000 megapascals, and we know that the veneering ceramic is much weaker. We know that Impress 2 is somewhere in between, which is now uh, Emacs, as you all know. Uh, we do have strong materials. We, we can use them, but we always have the choice, and we always have to make that decision. Unfortunately, with zirconia and lithium disilicate, it's, you can go both ways. Uh, for me, the substructure, if it's made with lithium disilicate or zirconia, uh, they're both strong, they're both aesthetic, and they're both easy to use. Now, of course, there's a small difference between the, the two materials. While the lithium disilicate can give you more translucency and zirconia gives you more strength, uh, in total, the, the indications do overlap in, in, some, in some regions. I would like to uh, present you with your certificate of appreciation. That's also a little present from...